What in the Jewish mutant ninja turtle dreidels in the half shell tore our power is going on here? Look at your man emerging from the sewer. Get out of my way. Excuse me. Excuse me. All right, move on. Nothing to see here. Please disperse. Nothing to see here. Please. Make it clear, Israel is our ally, will always be our ally, and they are not guilty of genocide, and I will support Israel forever. God bless Israel Make Argentina great again, Trump. Make Argentina great again. Viva la libertad, carajo! This is Stranger Than Fiction and today you, me, the body of Christ in general are about to witness some prophetic things happening as we speak, in particular with this video. Hopefully you have a basic understanding of the end times in the Bible if you, let's say, just recently became saved and don't know the correct doctrines, then you need to do some study on your own to get a bigger picture. I will leave some links in the description below for that purpose. So anyways, with that out of the way, let's shift our attention to Israel and watch some of the news that just came out about red heifers and the sacrificial ceremony that should happen, I guess at any day now, and how this ceremony pretty much paves the way for the rebuilding of the third temple in Jerusalem. Now, from reading 1 Corinthians 3, we know that we, our bodies, are the temple of God. Uh, but in the time of Jacob's trouble, or Daniel's 70th week, the seven year period, well, at that time, the rules changed because the body of Christ saved Christians. All those that were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise leave. And after we leave, God starts dealing with Israel again. And now you have a different gospel, so to speak, because now you have to believe in Jesus. The Holy Spirit can indwell you, but you can't take the mark. Worship the beast and his image. 
and if any man does that, he gets God's wrath and has a guaranteed place in the lake of fire. You can lose your salvation by taking the mark just like that. So it's a completely different setup. At that time, no one is guaranteed salvation because you can lose it by taking the mark and that's why you have to endure to the end to be saved. Read Matthew 24. It talks about the Sabbath day, um, it, about Judea. Christians aren't in, that, in those regions. So the only sealed group that has complete assurance is the 144,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel. Everyone else has to endure to the end. So if the Antichrist has to sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, where do you think that's going to happen? How can this happen when we are the temples of God? It only works if the body of Christ leaves at the catching up, the so-called rapture, and the third temple is rebuilt in Jerusalem. And that's what's going to happen. That's why it's so significant. We have to rightly divide the word of truth because the whole Bible is not meant for us as Christians in the church age. This is why dispensation is so important. God will pour out his wrath on the nation of Israel, Mystery Babylon, Roman Catholicism and the lost wicked world for rejecting Jesus Christ. The third temple is absolute key in Bible prophecy. And with all that said, let's dive into it. Nine Jewish priests plot a land on the Mount of Olives and five red heifers. All these elements are in place for what some Jews and Gentiles believe is the key to building the third Jewish temple. Some also believe it indicates the coming of the Messiah. Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem. The five red heifers are now in a secure, undisclosed location in Israel. Plans include moving them sometime soon to a visitor's center in Shiloh, where the tabernacle of the Lord once stood for nearly 400 years. The Book of Numbers explains that ashes of the red heifer are used to purify priests for their service in the temple. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, this is the ordinance of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring you a red heifer without blemish, in which there is no defect and on which a yoke has never come. You shall give it to Eliezer the priest, that he may take it outside the camp, and it shall be slaughtered before him. Its offal shall be burned, for the water of purification it is for purifying from sin." These red heifers are now between one and a half to two years old. To replicate the ceremony mentioned in the Bible, they need to be at least three years old. And within that time span, they cannot have a blemish or anything that would disqualify them for the ceremony, even one white or black hair. According to those working on the project, the ceremony of the red heifer needs to be performed on the Mount of Olives and in a place that would have looked directly into where the temple stood. The land I'm standing on, bought 12 years ago, fits both of those standards. It had to be exactly at the front of place that the priest that made this ceremony can see the holy of the holy place. Rabbi Yitzhak Mamo heads Yuvne, so. Jerusalem, dedicated to the goal of rebuilding the third temple. He owns the land here on the Mount of Olives. And we hope that in a year and a half from today, we can make here in this area the ceremony of the red heifer that actually will be the first step to the temple. Mamo says the ceremony needs priests who have not been defiled by touching anything dead. The Temple Institute actually has uh, nine pure priests. They didn't born in hospital, okay, they born at home. Mm -hmm. Because they are priests, so anyway, they don't go to any cemetery and they are pure mm -hmm. and they are waiting. 
So we have the priest, we have the red heifer, we have the land, and we have everything ready. We just need to wait another one and a half year. Byron Stinson of B'nai Israel, a group dedicated to building a biblical Israel, works with Rabbi Mamo and helped find the red heifers in the U.S. He says these would be the first in 2,000 years and that the process toward a third Jewish temple began when the Jewish people started their return to the Promised Land from the four corners of the world, culminating with Israel becoming a nation. And the temple is the center of Jerusalem. And so how can it happen and how will it happen? I don't think anyone really knows for sure. Stinson believes the temple is meant to be a house of prayer for all nations. In the Bible, it says when Solomon built the first temple, he said this is a house of worship for all nations. That's what the temple is. And I think a lot of people think it's just the Jewish temple, but that's not true. It's for all the nations of the earth. Author Joel Rosenberg wrote about the third temple in his novel, The Copper Scroll, and tells CBN News Jews have different views on the subject. Jews are divided, actually, between does the Messiah himself have to come and build the temple, or do you build the temple and the Messiah, Messiah comes? So among those Jews, Israelis, who care, that's actually, they're, they're divided into two different camps. I think most Israelis don't think about it, don't care, and actually would get a little worried of talk of a third temple because we already have enough trouble. Rosenberg also sees various points of view throughout the Christian community those who think about it and those who don't. Most Christians, I think, don't think about the third temple, uh, but those who do uh, believe that it will be built before Jesus returns for the second coming, not necessarily before the rapture, but definitely before the second uh, coming, and, uh, and that the Antichrist will take over that third temple during the tribulation and try to rule the world from there. Could it happen in our lifetime? That, to me, is intriguing. I think we don't know, uh, but there, but the, but there are some Jews who are really making, as you're as you're reporting on, preparations to get ready for that moment, and that's something to watch closely. Stinson says they plan to invite everyone to the red heifer ceremony that may take place in Passover 2024. Everything is in place now with the red heifers. As long as they stay pure, one of them stays pure, then we have everything in place, including the priests. Mamo says, according to the Jewish sage Maimonides, there were nine red heifers from Moses to the second temple. It's not his way to write, but suddenly he said, the tent will make the Messiah. We know that the Messiah will make the tent. Maybe we have the privilege to be one of these people that uh, helped the Messiah to do it. So we're waiting. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, the Mount of Olives, Jerusalem. The conflict in Gaza now entering its sixth month. The Israeli operation to root out Hamas terrorists there has resulted in the deaths of 30,000 Palestinians and 242 Israeli soldiers. The war started after Hamas attacked Israel on October 7th, killing almost 1,200 people and taking nearly 230 hostage, some still in captivity. Despite the deadly outcome across the region, one trigger for the Hamas rampage has been widely overlooked. Chris Livesay has the story from Jerusalem. The infamous October 7 massacre that sparked a war. But one confounding yet eye-opening motive has escaped the headlines. In a recent speech, a Hamas spokesman blamed the Jews for bringing red cows to the Holy Land. The cows he's talking about at a secure, undisclosed location are these. Red heifers, to be precise. Some Jews and Christians believe they're the key to rebuilding the historic Jewish temple in Jerusalem and to beckoning the Messiah. To understand, you have to go back nearly 2,000 years when the ancient Romans destroyed the last temple in the city. To rebuild it, these believers point to the Bible's Book of Numbers. It commands the Israelites to sacrifice a red heifer without defect or blemish, and that has never been under a yoke. Only then can the temple rise again. Caring for them on an Israeli settlement in the West Bank is Yitzhak Mamo. So we have here, uh, after a long research we find in uh, Texas. In Texas? Uh, yeah, yeah, Texas, United States of America. Texas Red Angus, flying them 7,000 miles to Israel. This is not a publicity stunt. What, what do you mean? Meaning, this is something you take very seriously. Harry Potter is a good story. 
The Bible is not story. The Bible is a way of God to lead us. A massive altar already awaits where the heifers are to be burned. According to some believers, the ceremony needs to be performed right here on the Mount of Olives, looking directly into where the temple once stood. But something else now stands in its place. The Dome of the Rock and Al-Aqsa Mosque, among the holiest sites in Islam. Today, only Muslims are allowed inside, but that's not stopping Jewish activists outside. Once you got, you started here. Six days a week, Melissa Jane Kronfeld leads groups from around the world who defiantly pray, as close as armed guards permit. It's not about the destruction of Islamic holy sites. It's about preserving this place and being guardians over the house of God for all people. So you're happy with it where it is? No, it's going to go 100%, but I believe it's, gonna it, go. it's 100%. Yeah, the whole thing is going to go. We have to build a temple. When you say that Dome of the Rock has to go, MJ, it's hard for me to imagine something more incendiary. Well, let me ask you something. The Middle East seems pretty destabilized right now, and the war, if I'm not mistaken, is already here. To be clear, hers is a dream not shared by the Israeli government or by the vast majority of Israelis and Jews, but it's been enough to incite numerous Islamist groups. Hamas has dubbed its October 7 assault on Israel the Al-Aqsa wave and has the Dome of the Rock on its emblem. But this is sacred ground to billions of Muslims globally, not just Hamas terrorists, stresses Imam Mustafa Abu Sway of Al-Aqsa Mosque. Al-Aqsa Mosque belongs to all Muslims. So you'll find reaction from Indonesia to Toronto to New York. That's really given. Al-Aqsa Mosque belongs to all Muslims and the Muslims today are two billion people, two billion people. Simply by performing these acts, are, are these Jewish activists kicking a hornet's nest? They are. They are. A hornet's nest they're kicking all the way to Capitol Hill. So good to see you here in the nation's capital. Those sacred cows were showcased in Washington at a recent prayer gathering. Many evangelicals believe these red heifers will usher Christ's second coming. And we need the Messiah to come, right? So for me, the red heifer is red for the blood of Jesus Christ. Back in the West Bank, Mamo says the ceremony could take place any day. Mamo says the ceremony could take place any day. But can you understand why Hamas could be outraged by something like this. I cannot understand that even if they are right, why they have to slot and uh, rape people to win their war. Terrorists have been attacking us before we ever dreamed of these cows, he reflects. They don't need them as an excuse to kill. For CBS Saturday Morning, Chris Livesay. It's because we believe that as a Jewish people, we all believe every rabbi holds by the same thing, that the Messiah is right around the corner. And before that comes, the whole world is freaking out and the whole world is confused. The Jewish people are harbinger for truth in this world. We are supposed to be a light unto the nations. So are we concerned about it? It's not comfortable. No one wants to be in that position. But in a very short time, the whole world will see what is going to happen is that the Messiah will come and there'll be peace on earth. Everybody is going to be happy and you will be able to see and witness godliness on earth. And we're in the last moments right now. That's why the whole world is freaking out. We have to know that the third temple will be built in the Holy Land of Israel extremely, extremely soon. And this is such an interesting idea because for some reason it's controversial. The, the world gets very excited when the Jewish people speak about this idea. But the truth is that the world is so focused on this is because this is the purpose of reality. This is the holiest place on earth, the Temple Mount and the Third Temple. And this is the place where God's glory will be revealed to the world. So surely there's a, there's a sensitivity to this idea because it's the most crucial piece of land on earth. This means that we want to see the revelation around this world. Just like we're, we're in the final generation, we want to see our place in the Torah. The Torah, the most, the main event has yet to happen yet. All the beautiful stories we read about in the Torah and the Bible, they're amazing. But we shouldn't be looking back like, ah, oh, the good old days. No, the best is yet to come. We're in the final generation. The third and everlasting temple will be built in our days, and that will be the height of the Bible, of the Torah. We're in the new chapter of, of reality. 
This is what's been promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Obviously, the Torah never changes, but the promised prophecy in the Torah has yet to happen yet. It's happening in our time. So we're actually in the most exciting point of history. My father, Oliver yeah. Shalom, was a keen Zionist. In fact, he got into serious trouble with my mother when at the wedding reception, which was a few days after the founding of the State of Israel, he managed to toast the State of Israel and somehow forgot to mention my mother. But my father, Oliver Shalom, and so many Jews found it difficult to believe in the coming of the Mashiach. I said to him once, Daddy, you were born in 1910. You saw the worst horror unleashed on the Jewish people in history. And four years after the end of that nightmare, the Jewish people had a sovereign state for the first time in over a thousand years. If I'd been around in 1930 and told you that all that was about to take place, you'd have laughed at me. So is the coming of Mashiach that much more outlandish? Imagine... You've never seen water boil. Imagine you lived in a world where there just was no means to heat something hotter than around 200 Fahrenheit or 90 degrees Celsius. You'd imagine that water just got hotter and hotter and hotter. The idea that a cataclysmic change in the nature of the water, turning it into vapor, would seem absurd, fanciful in the extreme. It's difficult for us to imagine cataclysmic change. Today was like yesterday, and yesterday was like the day before that, but things do change, and sometimes cataclysmically. There's no realistic day-after scenario for the war in Gaza. It's clear that Hamas will not settle for a state unless it's from the river to the sea. And on the other hand, Israel isn't about to meekly accept a set of water wings supplied, no doubt, by the UN, and happily paddle out into the med with Tel Aviv fading into the distance. This is an existential war without a solution. It's not a question of how to divide up the cake, you know, where do we draw the line on the map? You get this bit, I'll swap you this bit. This is a war of ideals, a titanic clash of cultures that will not and cannot end in a stable compromise. As a believing Jew, it's clear to me that the only solution to this situation is Mashiach, the Messiah for whom we daily hope, wait and pray. Now, I'm sure people would think that that too is a bit of a pipe dream because nothing in our experience has ever resembled Mashiach, Messiah. God promised the Jewish people he would bring us a Messiah. And just as he promised us that he'd preserve us throughout our long years of exile and torment, and he's done that against all the laws of history, so I believe he will bring his Redeemer to Zion. I'm looking forward to seeing water boil. But uh, Moriel, you're here for a very special event that is like a, a conference about the red heifers. People might not believe it if we said that there's actually red heifers in Israel that potentially could be used as part of the rebuilding of the third temple. But that's what's going on, right? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. So in September of uh, last year, September 15th, we actually brought five red heifers from Texas over to Israel. Uh, the organization Bonet Israel, they're the ones who brought it over. Um, and now we have the heifers up north. It's at, they're actually in a disclosed location because of security reasons, uh, but we're moving them to Shiloh and we're building a visitor center there. Uh, the visitor center is going to be also for people to come and find out more about the red heifers, learn about them. Um, and also it's going to be a research center so that we can research and find out how we can have the highest chance of keeping them red and breeding more red heifers that we might need for the future. Well, so red heifers, are you saying that there's a potential that the third temple could be built soon? Yes, sir. So. It's actually very interesting because uh, Maimonides, in Hebrew it's Rambam, he wrote that there were nine red heifers that were used over the course of, of biblical history. The first one was Moses and uh, eight other ones that were used in the first and second temple. And he writes that the tenth red heifer uh, will be used by the Mashiach. So I guess we're living in the times of Mashiach. So how long are we talking about? Are the red heifers ready now? Um, they're they're not ready yet because they have to be of age, which is above the age of two. And the ones we have now are about a year and four months old. So we have a bit of a, a little bit to wait. So the red heifer could be available 
for a potential uh, rebuilding of the third temple in just eight months. Yes, sir. Will you be ready with everything else by that time? Well, I think it's more of a question of uh, if the people are ready. You know, we have everything in place. We have the priests, we have the heifers, we have the, the spot on the, uh, the Mount of Olives. We have... What's significant about the spot on the Mount of Olives? So the red heifer ceremony needs to take place... Biblically. Biblically on the Mount of Olives, not on the Temple Mount. So uh, we even have that ready. And all we need is for the people to wake up and understand that this is the time. And when the people say this is the time, what happens? Then we do a huge ceremony. We have people come from all over the world um, to come to the ceremony and celebrate with us. Is this a moment when Isaiah's prophecy of my house should be called a house of yes, prayer sir. for all nations could start? Yes, sir. I really believe that that's, that's what's going to be. The temple, in my eyes and how I understand uh, the perspective of Judaism, is that exactly like you said, it, that the third temple is gonna be house of prayer for all of the nations. It's a center for people to come together and worship God together and spread peace throughout the world. The truth is, um, the way I see it is that the Islamic world is kind of, uh, let's say the Islam, Islam is, is very, very similar to Judaism. I don't know if you guys have read the Quran or, or learned a little about, about Islam. It's very, very similar. But the problem is, is that it's almost like replacement theology in Christianity that, you know, the Jews sinned and they left God and God left them. And now the new correct religion is Islam. And, it, and, and they even say that, you know, uh, the Jews themselves uh, Bnei Israel, the ch children of Israel, used to be Muslim. Used to, they used to be Muslim. And then they strayed away from the path of Islam. And now the real Islam is the, the only, the, you know, wow. is in the book of the Quran and whoever follows the Prophet Muhammad. Um, and that's the way I see it, that there's really a, 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 a religious conflict which is in the background here. Because the second the people of Israel come back to Israel and especially to the Temple Mount and want to rebuild the Temple, then that means that our prophecies are coming true. And it kind of, uh, you know, knocks down their, their building that they, that they built. So that's the way I see it. Uh, kibbutz Galuyot in Hebrew, it's called that people come from all of the different exiles, come back to the land of Israel. That's the next step. Then we, we reconquered Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. We gave it back, but we did conquer it. That was our biggest mistake. And by the way, my Muslim's friend tell me that. They said, it's your fault. You guys made that mistake. Um, but that's the next step. The red heifers, that's the next step. The building of the, of the temple, that's the next step. So we're moving in the right direction. Um, and it's all one process that we're, you know, so lucky to be part of. Moriel, when, when President Trump went to move the American embassy to Jerusalem, everyone told him, you're going to cause World War III. I was on the ground there. I'm sure you were on the ground there too. Did you, any, did you witness any World War III? Kind I didn't of, see any World War III. Nothing happened? No, sir. Everyone says that when you decide and when the Jewish people decide to build the third temple, all hell's going to break loose and there's going to be another, there's going to be World War III. Um, what do you say? Is there going to be peace brought by the temple or will there be war? I think we should go back to Islam because uh, it's very interesting. So my friends there told me um, that there's actually a verse in the Quran that says that God gave the Jews basically kicked them out of the land twice. He gave them two opportunities and then brought them back. And if they do good, they'll do good to, for everyone. And if they do bad, they do bad to themselves and for everyone. And they told me, if you guys do good and you guys come and rebuild the temple, then that's what God wants. But right now, what you guys are doing is not good. What you guys are doing is not good at all. And that's, and, and that's the proof that you guys, uh, you know, you guys left him and he left you. So it's, I think in the end of the day, you know, we're kind of scared of them and their reaction and, 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 and everybody else's reaction. But we're very close, you know, and I think it's just like sometimes you just have to make one little step that's going to bring someone closer to you, uh, bring two people together. And sometimes it seems so far apart, especially with all the, you know, terrorist attacks and things like that but 
And at the end of the day, I think most people, they want peace, they want to live, and they want to believe in God, they want to express their, their, their belief. And I think that there's a way that we could do that together. And you're saying that the Third Temple would indeed bring peace, not war. That's what I think. That's what I believe. Do you ever wonder if one day you'll have to flee the United States? I mean, I think that every Jew throughout world history who has a brain and knows history has always wondered if a country that is not a Jewish state is going to eternally provide them security guarantees and full citizenship, of course. I mean, that, that's, uh, I think, to, to think that that's why the existence of the state of Israel is the single greatest guarantor of my loyalty to the United States, frankly. Right, because Israel exists, that means the United States is going to be a more welcoming place for me because Israel is there as a backstop in case anything should go wrong. But I feel you try to dodge the question. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll ask it, it uh, bluntly. <laughs> Why won't you make Aliyah to the state of Israel? Because you can take the night to think about it, uh, by the way. <laughs> because the fundamental principles of the United States are good, eternally good, and worth upholding. And my fight to do that as a Jew is deeply important, not just to people who are not Jewish, but particularly to Jews. So in other words, my Jewish mission does not conflict with my presence in the United States or my citizenship in the United States or my loyalty to the United States. Shouldn't Jews live in the state of Israel? Shouldn't all Jews live in the state of Israel? All Jews, the Jews. Jews should live where they can do the most, where they can be a light to the nations. And for me, as a person with millions and millions of followers in the United States, promoting what I think are values that are eternally good, living in, it, living in the United States is a point of, of I think, morality for me. Have such a good digital twin that you'll be able to go into the metaverse, into a virtual reality world, turn a dial, pull a switch, feel around, and actually change it in the real oh, plant? Absolutely, absolutely. And this is not, this is not far, far off. I mean, the physical and the digital worlds, they will grow together and the result is exactly what you just said i wanted to ask when you all think we're going to move from this form factor to something that's on your face glasses and compute when computing's all on the edge all right 50 seconds who wants to answer quickly i think it will go it, it will first of all it will definitely happen I, I i i was talking about 6g earlier which is around 20 2030 i would say that by then definitely the smartphone as we know it today will not anymore be, be the usual kind of the most common interface. Wow. This, this, many of these things will be built directly into our, our, our bodies. Many of these things will be built directly into our, our, our bodies. Many of these things will be now, built directly. Just after the 25th anniversary of the establishment of 3GPP, we have taken an exciting new step. Last week, the work plan for release 19 was announced the last major release of 5G Advanced, which will both fine-tune what's possible with 5G Advanced and start to build the foundations of a bridge for a smooth evolution to 6G. Let's talk first about the role of Release 19 in fine-tuning 5G Advanced, the culmination of a journey to build the most capable and flexible mobile network ever. Firstly, XR Extended Reality promises new levels of information at our fingertips. For consumers, we're on the cusp of seeing virtual reality help us to navigate through our busy lives. And similar functionality will enable the industrial metaverse to diagnose problems and visualize solutions in record time. Let's move on to take a look at the second aspect of last week's announcement. Release 19 will take what we've learned from the 5G journey and start to study some aspects of how a new 6G system can be built even better. We could call this the beginning of the bridge to 6G. That's not to say that 6G is just around the corner. We don't expect the first version of the 6G specifications to be complete until the end of 2028, leading to deployments in 2030. So 5G advanced networks will continue to serve us well for some years to come. But these are complex systems and we need to take the time to get the directions right for 6G. First, there's artificial intelligence and machine learning, AI and ML. I just want you to know. I love you, Mummy and Daddy. I know you too, sweetheart. And I'm going to ask you to take the filter off. Will you do that for me? I 
think I've been uncomfortable for a very long time. We know. I've been thinking ever since I was born that I don't belong in this body. Oh my God. It's all right. It's really okay, darling. I've been reading up on it and I think I'm trans. Oh, sweetheart. Oh, it's all right, darling. I swear. It really is. I look at us, we're fine. We're completely fine, aren't we? <laughs> and I know we might be a bit slow and a bit old and this is going to be confusing for us and we'll make a mess of it sometimes, but we love you. Hmm? We love you. We absolutely love you. We always will. I mean, we don't need to rush. We've got lots of time to talk about this. And you know, if it turns out that we've got a, a lovely son instead of a lovely daughter, then well, we'll be happy. Hmm? No, I'm not transsexual. Oh. Is that not the word now? But you said trans. Is, what did we call you then? I'm not transsexual. I'm transhuman. Oh, OK. I'm sorry. They keep changing the words. I don't know the difference. I don't want to change sex. No, sure. We, we say gender now, don't we? I'm sorry. I said I'm not comfortable with my body, so I want to get rid of it. This thing. All the arms and legs and every single bit of it. I don't want to be flesh. I'm really sorry, but I'm going to escape this thing and become digital. What do you mean? They say one day soon they'll have clinics in Switzerland where you can go and you'll sign a form and they'll take your brain and download it into the cloud. And your body? Recycled. Into the earth. So you want to kill yourself? I want to live forever as information because that's what transhumans are, Mum. Not male or female. Better. Where I'm going, there's no life or death. There's only data. I will be data. How interesting. Um, 5G is only a bridge to 6G. 6, 6G is the final goal. And the mark of the beast is 666. And we'll have a 6G technology in the future. 6 is the number of a man, according to the Bible. So you could say that this is 666G tech that we'll have, which is crazy. But don't worry all the naysayers, the Bible is just an old archaic book. And uh, <laughs> I just hope that this nightmarish world will end soon. And yeah, I guess uh, that'll be it for today. And uh, as always, thank you for watching. Um, please check out all the links I provided below and um, consider supporting for their work. Just hang in there, you know. All of us are dealing with the same stuff. But um, our suffering is worth it. We'll have heavenly rewards. So keep that in mind. Thank you for watching and I will see you next time. Bye bye. It's like would they say within thirty years why people are gonna be the minority? I think yeah, we'll so also breed out too. looking forward to it. Can't yeah, no wait. Shit. Like, is my kid white? I don't even Listen, know. Your kid is definitely not white. Well You're yeah, half you kinda Jewish just... and your kid's half Mexican. Yes. Yeah,